Okay, so today I'm talking to you about Daredevil language learning. And the theme here is going to be a little experiment for me. It's, it's more about turning your weaknesses into strengths. Okay, so uh, it's very easy to see other people succeed and know that you have some kind of a setback and kind of get stuck in the mindset that this setback is going to hold you back forever. And what I'm going to try and do is frame some of the setbacks I've personally gone through and show you how I've tried to turn them around to my advantage. And I hope you'll see parallels in your own lives. So if you don't know who I am, um, I have books and blogs and videos and traveling and polyglot and speaking and so on. So that's me. But the more interesting stuff is Daredevil. So if you don't know, Daredevil is a Marvel comic, and I really like this guy because he saves New York, which I really appreciate, because I live there, you know, so I know the streets are safe, and he is blind, so a blind superhero, but because he was blinded, he actually got all of these new powers, so um, his backstory is that he saved an old man who was going to get hit by a car as a, as a boy. He jumped out, saved the old man, but a truck swerved and all of this um, radioactive ooze went into his face and blinded him. And interesting sidebar, that radioactive ooze also went down the sewers and created the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. True story. It's the same one. I'm not making that up. Mm -hmm. So, he was blind. But some part of the radioactive ooze gave him some kind of superpowers where his hearing was improved and he could use, like how he could hear the sounds reflecting off walls to know where the wall was and eventually, to, you know, improve his skills and be like a kung fu master or whatever it is and kicking all of the bad guys' asses and saving everybody. And I think that's a very interesting concept because when we think of blind, blindness, we imagine someone who's helpless. But here, this concept is this blind guy is the one actually protecting us. And his blindness, which is a weakness, gave him his strengths of super hearing and so on. So, <clears throat> a couple of things that I had to go through to give you some context of how I've turn this into an advantage for myself. I had to go through speech therapy. When I was growing up for several years, I had great difficulty speaking English. So uh, the letter R was so hard for me, I, I couldn't say it. And to this day, my big brother, he teases me that my favorite TV show was Star Trek. Just because I couldn't, I couldn't roll, like even the English rolling of the R. Um, so. That was a problem. But the thing is, here's me, six years old, clowning around. And as a six-year-old, I went to speech therapy, and I had these lessons. And what, I think that actually helped me a lot as a language learner. Because I started to see English outside of the context of just presuming this is the way people talk to each other. Like, you would normally think for your mother tongue, you just use it, you don't think about it. But I started thinking about the language outside of the language. I started to see how I could learn to pronounce things uh, correctly and how things are pronounced differently. And that helped me a lot, but something a little bit later, along the same lines that helped me, is another weakness of mine that you guys all know about, and I've struggled with this my whole life. It's that I'm Irish. I know. I know. So, being Irish means that I actually have great difficulty pronouncing the TH sound. And I didn't even think about this, because in the part of Ireland that I'm from, we just don't have that sound. But the first job I ever had abroad was teaching mathematics in the US. And uh, in one of my classes, I said, 33 and a third. And the 
14 year olds I was teaching, as you can imagine, were uh, very eager to show me how ridiculous that sounded and say, say it again, say it again. And I was like, oh, I want to be taken seriously. So I had to go home and spend hours trying to get that sound. So I was like, three, three, three. And it took me a while, but I eventually got it. So I can say it now. And usually only when I'm like, distracted and flustered, I will start saying tree trees or whatever it is. So this is something that I did as a 19 year old. So as you can imagine, when I'm meeting people and I want to encourage them to learn languages and they're trying to learn a language which has a different sound that they're not used to, and they are absolutely positive in saying, my mouth just isn't made for this sound. I will never learn this. Then I tell them that my mouth wasn't made for the THs, but I learned it. And just two years after I learned the THs, I learned the R in Spanish. So that's kind of the context and why you will see me argue so passionately that you can teach an old dog new tricks, you can be past whatever cut-off ages there are that people come up with, and you can learn new things. So this has just been ingrained in me because of this struggle that I went through. So something else that I had to deal with is I'm actually half deaf. That causes a lot of issues because uh, I, can I can hear things way less clearly I have to focus a lot more when people are speaking to me. And if you ever see me talking to people, you will probably notice a lot more now. I tend to be leaning in like this. I'm not doing it for a dramatic effect. So being half deaf has really, really sucked for when I'm trying to learn a language that I'm already struggling with and I can't understand so much and then they say something that I probably would have understood if I just heard it. But that weakness gave me another strength that I've just learned with time. And this is why you can imagine I'm a big fan of Daredevil, because he is blind and has super hearing, and I think to myself, I'm half deaf, maybe I have like half super sight or something? Sadly, it didn't work out that way, but I, figured something else out. So my background is in engineering. And <clears throat> there's this uh, thing, I actually wrote my undergraduate thesis on something called trellis code modulation. And not necessarily getting into the technical side of it, but very simply, redundancy was something I found that I could transfer from communications theory and engineering to language learning. So. Uh, this trellis code modulation is used on like phone lines and some other digital systems and because there's going to be noise and weather and damage some of the data might get lost so they actually send twice as much data and there's just redundant information that helps cushion things and we have this in languages like you will understand if somebody is speaking in English and they don't say the word there you will know what they mean, even without the definite article. And so what I found is I would be in, like, I'd be learning Spanish, for instance, and um, I'd be in a nightclub, where, which is just like hell if you can't hear things already. And I'd be trying to hear what somebody's saying, and I might hear them say, da 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 la da 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 And I would think, that la that is extra redundancy built in that tells me that it's actually some kind of a feminine word. Okay, that cuts it down. So he's definitely not asking me if I have like a pet elephant because that would be masculine for sure. So it, it's this extra bit of information. And you would be surprised how much redundancy is in a language. Things that when you take them out, you could still understand. Words that have a lot of syllables are fantastic because if you only, if there's a six syllable word and you only really hear four syllables, 
a lot of the time, you could still figure out what it's saying. I always imagine it like a noisy telephone call. An example I always give people as a beginner learner is that you're on the call and somebody's like, do, 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 dinner at 8 p.m. And you don't hear the rest. You can extrapolate, they're likely saying, do you want to have dinner at 8 p.m.? And not, I've just killed your sister and she's going to be my dinner at 8 p.m. <laughs> you know? And like you can extrapolate one from the other because of context. So this is something being half deaf has forced me to do in English. I, you will say something to me and I'll understand a lot of it, but I actually missed a few parts of it. And I have to extrapolate. And that skill has helped me learn languages better. And then, another big one for me that um, you very likely wouldn't know is I have ADHD. And if you guys don't know what this is, it's essentially where you have lower dopamine levels and it makes it very hard to stay stimulated for long periods of time. Because that buzz you get as you're learning a language and you're making progress and you're feeling so proud of yourself, that's dopamine in your, in your brain. And people with ADHD have a lot less of that, and it makes it a lot harder to do a lot of things. So this means that I'm going to get bored very easily, even if the material is interesting, because you get distracted a lot faster if, um, if you have to deal with this. And you'd have issues with your working memory. So like I've had to find ways to get around these things a lot of the time, and if any of you have ever seen me do like a YouTube live video or something, one thing I do is I have someone help me with the questions. And they're looking at everybody's questions and they're pinging me privately. And the reason is, if someone asks me a question and I start answering it, and a question comes up on screen and says whatever it might say, then that pulls my attention away and I forget what I was just talking about. So it's, it's kind of like a soft version of the movie Memento where the guy just completely forgets what just happened. That's kind of what it's like. You know, I still, I still know where I am. I know who I am. I know what I'm doing, but I have no idea what I was just saying. So, this makes a lot of things harder, of course. It's very difficult to multitask. So, if I'm even, even if I'm driving, I can't talk to you. I can't. I, I'm trying to focus on the road. Or you can ask me a very simple question, like, where, where are we driving to? I, I can answer that question for sure. But if you ask me something complicated, then I'm going to get flustered. I, I, like, I can't hold these two things in my brain at the same time. And it creates huge problems for planning. Um, because you can only think of this one thing at a time. It makes it very hard to make a hierarchy in how you process tasks. And that leads to people just saying, well, just try harder. You know, which is very hard to hear because you may be trying as hard as you can. And this leads to so much chaos. Like, this presentation you're seeing was ready two hours ago. Because just, I could have I done it like two weeks ago, but two weeks ago I was doing something else rushing at the last minute. So you're essentially constantly in a chaotic rushing mode because... Uh, like, I don't have a very good ability to create a hierarchy of priorities. So I'm always doing whatever's urgent. I always give the example of, like, if you imagine going to a park to study, and you might sit on a bench and have your book open, and, you know, you've got nice fresh air and birds and stuff. That, that situation is hell to me. Because there's no way I could possibly focus. I'd be like, Swan! Oh, okay, nice, nice cool swan. Children laughing! Whoa, oh, what's so funny? I want to get in that joke. Oh. And I cannot focus. So I have to be like locked in complete solitude with music and everything, and it is a huge issue with learning languages. Because that means the passive learning is just impossible for me. I can't be like washing the dishes and hearing something in my ear. That's just not going to work. If I'm washing the dishes, I can only think about the dishes. I, I'm like 
did I scrub this enough times? And that's the only thing I can have in my mind. So I see people doing two things at once, and to me, I'm like, wow, like, were you bit by a radioactive spider or something? Like, come on. Uh, it also means that long study periods are so hard because if you have ADHD, you cannot sit still and you can't focus for long periods of time. You'll even, you, you will lose track, you'll get bored, you'll get distracted. There's always distractions, even if you close yourself off from them. So the idea of getting many hours of studying done seems impossible. And that's important, especially if you want to learn languages intensively. Um, active memory issues I mentioned. But now, let's, let's see some advantages. So I've, I've given my case, it sucks to have ADHD. And some of you here might, might have it, some of you here might have other things that you struggle with. But try to see how can you get some kind of skill out of this. So, I, because I'm so bad at planning, I'm actually better at planning in certain situations. So, for instance, with this presentation, because I didn't know how to get it on the computer, I don't have a computer with me, I knew I'd be getting it off uh, like the internet, I had a Dropbox link. I had an iPad to HDMI converter. I had um, an email set up already with the link ready to go. And I very ceremoniously forgot the HDMI cable as I was uh, leaving the house. So the thing is, I actually presume things are going to go wrong. That is my default setting. Chaos. Things are going to break. So, I have a lot of buffer zones. I have a lot of things in place to kind of uh, protect from things going wrong. And I, t I tend to do that in languages as well. I plan for something to happen, but presume it'll be a disaster. And that means that I have my plan B ready. Because I will always try to have a plan B, because I'm used to things going wrong. It means that I've got thicker skin for this appointment. Because the thing is, with making mistakes, like I always tell people when I'm learning a language, I aim to make 200 mistakes a day. And that for me, that's so easy, because by breakfast, I've already made 200 mistakes in my day. You know? I've like realized I didn't do the laundry, so I have nothing to wear. Or I want to have cereal. Oh, I have no cereal and I have no milk. That's right, I was supposed to get that. And so, like, it's just constant mistakes all the time and trying to balance those out and make it work somehow. So, I expect to make mistakes. And the one thing about ADHD is I am immune from perfectionism because it is impossible for me to... I, I've, never, I've never experienced this mythical beast because it's just not going to happen when life is that chaotic. So that means that when things go wrong in languages, when I will conjugate the verb wrong, or I forget the words, or I try to practice with somebody and they're in a hurry, so I feel bad that they kind of brushed me off, all of that stuff, I expect it. And this kind of makes you have thicker skin. And it makes you, instead of, like, it still sucks, I'm still going to be sad, but I'll be like, ah, okay, I messed up. Oh, well, back to the books. And that's the, that's the way you, you roll with the punches. And you're a lot more likely to try many different things. Because another thing about ADHD is you'll try something, and then you'll try something else, and you'll do something else. So for instance, I've been very busy. I run a blog, I speak, I write books, I used to translate, I do consulting. I've worked in a lot of really weird jobs. I've been a youth hostel receptionist, obviously an English teacher, a maths teacher, an electronic engineer, I, my first ever job was investing on the FTSE 100 with someone else's money, uh, tech support. I used to work in an office job. This ridiculous thing is a laryngeal mask, mask array. I once had a job where I had to arrange the world's literature of laryng laryngeal masks array in chronological order. Oh my goodness, not a lot of fun. I was also a race controller at a go-kart center. And I would help people set up their cars and so on. Um, I was the manager of a yoga store. I was a first aid assistant, so I've been pretty busy. I've had a lot of different jobs, and that is because of my ADHD. So 
I am very likely to try many things before giving up. And in learning languages, this helped me a lot. Because when I first got into languages in school, the school system just didn't work for me, and I failed miserably. Barely passed. Then I moved to Spain, and I, like, on the flight over, I, like, crammed a few words, thinking, you know, I'll be able to speak Spanish, like, no worries, as soon as I get there, and that didn't obviously work, so I kind of gravitated towards the English-speaking community. But then, I went to group lessons, like, just for three or four people. I thought, that's going to be better than the 30 people classes, for sure. And I felt miserable because everyone else was way smarter than me, and I couldn't follow along. And then, I bought El Señor de los Anillos, the Lord of the Rings, and I was like, I have, I have this genius idea that's definitely going to work. I'm going to read Lord of the Rings from start to, start to finish, and then I'm going to be fluent in Spanish. <laughs> and that obviously didn't work. And then I tried studying the dictionary. Yes, I was that desperate. I studied a dictionary, and that didn't work. And I tried a lot of different things, but the thing is, I kept on trying. And I think if I had given up after those first two or three or 17 attempts of different language learning methods, then I would not have ever learned the language. But I kept going, and I found a way that worked for me, the whole speak from day one and avoiding English and so on. So I feel like I have the ADHD to, to thank for that. And then another advantage is hyperfocus. So I find it very hard to focus for long periods of time, but when I am focused on something, that is the only thing in the world. You know, I could be like just so deep into figuring out how some prefix will work in a language. And you could tell me the building's burning down. I'm, I'm just not even hearing you. I'm like, oh my God. Oh, wow. Esperanto is so logical. I love this. So that's the thing is you're so focused that you are more focused than people would otherwise be. And to kind of help me with this, the Pomodoro technique has been a little trick that has helped me get around this issue, because I would stay focused for 25 minutes and then just embrace the fact that I can't be focused and just take five minutes to stare out the window at some birds and just think, aren't birds great? <laughs> and then I'll go back. And, that, and that's kind of what I found is my weakness is I can, it is impossible for me to study for two hours straight but it's very possible for me to study for six hours in multiple 25-minute bursts. So that was something that I got from, from all of this. And you kind of come up with more optimism as a result of this, that you try so many things that you're eventually going to find one that works. I find when someone is pessimistic, it's very likely because they tried one thing, they failed, and then that has defined their project for them. You know, that like if I had decided the first thing I, I tried with Spanish means I am destined to never speak Spanish. But because I keep trying so many things, I have this natural optimism, you know? No matter what people would say, I would think, no, but there's gotta be a way around it, you know? I like the way that Steve took the question in the previous lesson, someone's like, Arabic's impossible. There's like so many dialects and so many of this. And he was like, well, I don't know any Arabic yet, but people have learned it, so it's got to be possible. And, and I like that. I like that optimism. And I try to kind of have that in my own um, learning sessions. And one thing about kids with attention issues is their mind wanders and they start imagining things and having really weird ideas. And that imagination has helped me with mnemonics. I've had... Uh, I find it easy to switch to mnemonics to, to learn languages. And maybe, like, one thing people might say is that if you're a beginner, you only end up talking about the weather. I find that hilarious. Because even when I'm an absolute beginner, my mind is so quick to go to so many things. I'll be like, yeah, yeah, it's raining today. Oh my God, is that a squirrel? And, oh, what? How, how do you eat dinner here? Oh, what? Time is our next lesson? I want to talk about that. And so my mind would go to so many places that I would probably drive a lot of people crazy. And I am totally guilty of that. Of very quickly getting people to be like, this guy, I hate him. 
but I will never bore you. So, that's, that's the thing, and that's given me that little extra edge in conversations. And I come up with systems like the Pomodoro uh, technique. There are other systems that I've used to get around my weaknesses, and those systems end up helping me learn a little bit better. Um, and then, because of the issues with planning, I come up with shorter milestones, like I have a mini goal of just this week. And that's why I started my YouTube channel to share like my Skype sessions or my spoken sessions, because I would just create that milestone, because I knew if I just said, I'm going to learn Spanish for these next months, then I would have crashed and burned. But if I was like, I'm going to upload a video in seven days of my first ever attempt to speak this language, then I would be forced to actually do the work. And I think a lot of people who wouldn't need these mini goals may not do that as much. So, I think I've given a pretty convincing argument for how this weakness that has really made a lot of things difficult for me that are not as difficult for a lot of people has kind of made me stronger in, in some ways. So I want you to think about this if you have some things you, you have to deal with, like dyslexia, for instance. I remember talking to somebody who told me that they've tried to get into language learning and they can't, they're, they're dyslexic, so they don't know how it's ever possible. And I talked to them about how they processed information and so on, and what we discovered is that they are so much better at listening, at understanding languages flowing as spoken words, even if they're not as good as uh, learning how to read the, the words. So they have naturally built this stronger skill. So that's a very important thing to, to keep in mind. And maybe if you're not as outgoing, you could think, well, how is this my strength? If I'm not out speaking to people all the time, maybe while I'm indoors, I am able to get the work done. Because that's a problem I have, is I will sit down to study, and even with my best attempts of Pomodoro and all this, I'll still reach the point where I'm like, uh, I, I want to go and do something, and I'll get up and I'll, I want to leave the house. And I'm jealous of people who don't have to deal with with that need that uh, kind of drives them crazy. And if you've no money, I actually found that things I did to get around not being able to afford lessons ended up making it a lot easier for me, like going to language exchange groups. That gave me a lot more confidence than paying for group uh, language lessons. So, some, so that actually, uh, that restriction gave me more, more power in some ways. And if you can't travel, I always tell people, of course, get on italki or something like this. So italki then ended up being a better form of language learning for me. And, and because of that, even though I can travel, I don't. I prefer to learn languages via Skype. Because it's so much more efficient, cheaper, better for timing and so on. So just a few examples, but uh, just some food for thought there, that if you have some big weakness that you feel has been holding you back, then try to see how can you make that make you stronger. Okay? So thank you very much, everybody, and I'd be very happy to take your questions. Hello, Benny. Thanks for the talk. I don't really have a question, just a comment to illustrate that I've even seen this daredevil thing with six-year-old kids in a, in a, when I was teaching at a primary school in Spain. And we had a kid in our class who was, had lots of trouble learning how to read and write Spanish. But the thing about the school was that they were trying to implement a bilingual thing. So I was there as an English teacher and I was studying from the classroom and I wasn't allowed to speak Spanish. And the little kid instead of, because he wasn't really able to do the writing bit, but he heard everything and he had a great memory, so he, in, he was actually the best at English in the class, ironically, because he just made sure that he could memorize all the words and do, the, do everything orally. And he even heard how he had to change Spanish words to make them sound English. So there was puma, and he turned that into plume, which is hilarious, and then his friend is, no, 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 you mean feather, but <laughs> it was funny. So I mean, Adults can do this, but even this is something that even I've even seen children do. So I don't see why you can't do it. That's all I want to say. 
Thank you very much. Absolutely. And that, that's a great point to reiterate how if you've tried something in one environment, that it may not work best for you. So in school, kids who have issues with attention, they can be so much stronger in so many ways. It's just that the school environment is really not made for them. You know? So that, that's a, a great example. Okay? I was just about to ask if your advantage of not being able to hear the singing was helping you focus on talking to us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's like a combined, a multiple superpower, because not only could I not hear it as well, but I can only focus on one thing at a time, so because I was speaking, like, they could have been screaming in agony with the apocalypse just arriving, I wouldn't have known. <laughs> um, I have a form of autism, and I, I'm sure there's plenty of uh, weaknesses in my case, but I could probably make my own talk about all the strengths I have. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know if you'd like to hear a few examples. Yeah, sure. Um, I started as a little kid at a youth circus, so I'm re and with, with the clowns, and I'm really, really good at hearing and adjusting to certain pronunciation and pitch and blah, blah, blah. And, yeah, I also have a complete disregard for uh, uh, humiliation. I mean, I love uh, making mistakes and humiliating myself. Uh, because, to me, that's material for anecdotes and breaking the ice and talking to strangers. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a Japanese guy. And, yeah... Uh, like that, I like being two steps ahead of my teacher. So he teaches me to count to 10, and I continue to 20 w without knowing whether I'm doing it right or not. Should I continue? <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's great that you can see these strengths. I, I, I know, I, I love just hearing that people could be able to give this talk themselves, because that's very important. And I, I think that a lot of people tend to see the only the positives. It's a big part of just our social media and like YouTube and everything is you will see everyone's strengths, but a lot of us have the same weaknesses. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah, and I still have a ton of problems. I mean, I'm, I'm as chaotic and unplanned as, as it gets, which does make me better at Im improvisation and mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, you wouldn't believe how many times I've gotten lost and asked locals to for the way and gotten up with creative ways to describe things, but, yeah. Yeah, well, you're welcome to come talk to me afterwards. I'd love to hear more of your, your list. Sure. Do you want to make sure I get to a few more questions from people, so... Yeah, that, that's why I first asked yeah. if you want... No, th th thanks for sharing. Appreciate it. Hello, Benny. I wanted to say the neuroplasticity of the brain is quite uh, staggering, you know, but we also have to make a uh, difference between what we can learn and what we can't, what we still can improve and what we can't, because we can't work on things that just have been destroyed in our brain or that, that, don't, or that don't exist anymore. For example, you know, you have HD, ADHD, you know, uh, improving certain um, abilities. My God, improving certain abilities linguistically is something different than becoming an orchestra musician, for example, which would be impossible in your case because you're half deaf. You know, and no matter how hard you try, it just would not be attainable. And for example, uh, me, you know, I had a. Um, paranoid schizophrenia, which is a little bit more severe than ADHD. And, uh, you know, so I started seeing people, you know, that didn't exist. And I was like, yeah, what can I do with these people, you know? Um, you know, they, they scared the shit out of me. But I was like, I could at least have conversations with them in different languages. <laughs> so, so I started to do so. I love that! I love that! <laughs> And, and, I, and I started to do so. And then when I was learning Arabic, I, had, uh, I met this guy, guy called Jihad, um, you know, with whom I practice Arabic from Saudi Arabia, and he used to correct my pronunciation, teach me some new stuff. 
After a while, my mother and the doctors tell me that this guy never existed. Uh, but I just wanted to tell you that the brain works in mysterious ways, you know. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that you found a way to make such a huge drawback turn to your advantage, you know? Thank that, you. That's, that, that's exactly the kind of thing I wanted to like, get people to think about today. So thank Thanks. you very much for, for sharing that. I appreciate no it. Thank you. Hi. Um, my issue for me, uh, I speak several languages. I, I can't sit still for more than five minutes. I don't I haven't been diagnosed with anything or, or what have you, but um, as I've gotten older, it's just not going in as fast. It's just not going in as fast as it used to, and I run out of patience, and I find that you know, after 15 minutes, I want to get up and run around and pace around the room. But I'm having, um, I guess, issues because of my age. I'm not ancient or anything, but I'm up there. And I'm not really sure how to, how to cope with that. I, you mentioned a Pomodoro technique, and I looked, and I thought maybe I need some kind of a shortened version of that, but repeated um, over and over and over. And um, I just don't want to give up the study of languages. It's been my whole life, and it's my, pa my biggest passion in life. So if you have any thoughts about that, I would welcome, Absolutely. welcome to hear them. So like, one thing that I think makes us uh, feel so bad about things like get distracted, you want to get up, is to resist that and think, this makes me a bad person. I need to find a way to not do that. I would think, how can you find a way for that to help you? So I know in my case, I'm fidgety and I need to be moving. And so whenever I'm a beginner language learner and I'm in a place that allows for it, I take dance lessons in the language. And I actually learned a lot of my Mandarin in Taiwan in dance lessons. Because I signed up for this gym that just had unlimited various hip hop and salsa and I would just go to everything. And it was great because I, like my body was occupied. I was doing what I was doing while I was listening to them like giving directions and I started to learn it in at least that context. Not as useful for like ordering or whatever, but it was getting me into the language, you know? And think if you're, if you want to, if you feel like you're not good at sitting down and doing things like that, maybe you just need a stand up desk, you know? Or maybe you need to have one of those fidget things that are going viral these days and just kind of use that all the time. There, so don't resist it. See, how can you run with it? And you might actually find that that makes you better than you would have been if you were sitting still. To just kind of give in to that. And yeah. But then otherwise, the that. Pomodoro technique is great because you will, uh, you will sit down, you'll do the work, but it's like it's still allowing you to get up because you, it's, you see these five-minute breaks as embracing how distracted you could get. And that's why I say... I will do the, mo the most worthless use of my time. Uh, whatever it is, go on Facebook and just stare at the wall. Whatever, whatever just I feel like I just want to do or don't want to do, by just letting myself do that, I get it out of my system. Or is, I think a lot of the time we try to think, how can I stop myself from doing that? And that is going to have more likeliness to fail, unfortunately. Yeah, I feel really bad for my italki teachers, because they, some of whom are sitting in this room who watch me fidget the entire time during class. But I, I'm also very concerned about aging, and maybe I just need to use shorter bursts of time to, for memory. Yeah, I mean, I always tell people I am a much better language learner now than I was uh, 20 years ago. So. Age has, has given me extra skills that I didn't have before. And my memory is just abysmal. You know, if I haven't written it down, like you could tell me the word for something, and it's just gone in the air immediately for me. So I, I find it very hard to, to look like when, when I'm speaking with people, that for me is practice, but it's very bad for vocabulary acquisition because they'll tell me a word and it's just in one ear out the other, you know? So. 
that's, that's okay. That's just, you accept that. You accept that in that particular case, maybe you're not remembering, but maybe there's another case where you will very actively remember the word. Maybe mnemonics, just, it's more engaging, it's more interesting, and it's helped, it's helped me personally. Um, maybe if you're not as engaged, you might try to read comic books in the language. There's like a lot of ways to make it more fun that might help you a lot better. No worries. Uh, yeah, oh, <clears throat> sorry. Come back to me after the talk. I'll help you with your problem. <clears throat> there you go. <laughs> but also, also what I could add is that there are studies that has demonstrated that if you walk while you are learning something, it's much better for your memory. And I was doing this with my kid when they had to learn poetry when they're small. We're just walking over and over and repeating the sentence by walking. And it works very, very well. Much more efficient than if I ask him to sit on the table and repeat the, the words after me. So take a book and walk. And read your book and, and repeat the sentence. And it, it's really very efficient. Okay. And I think we have time for maybe one more question. One or two? Okay, great. Okay, this is, um, this is not exactly a question, it's more of a comment. Um, I, it just dawned on me now, being in this room, that um, I guess we all know already how powerful language is, but just to be able to hear the stories of people overcoming the challenges, um, it's really just, it's mind-blowing for me. And that's why I wanted to say, it's that it's such a privilege to be here amongst all these people who are all united by the same passion. So, yeah. And you would be surprised. Share whatever you feel is holding you back. If you share it, you may actually meet people who are the same. And I've learned some really interesting things about how to handle ADHD issues by just being open about it with people and meeting others who deal with it and feeling less like I'm a freak of nature and more like, okay, this is acceptable and there are other people dealing with this. Maybe a final question? Oh. Well, thank you. Uh, I had just a slight realization earlier when you talked about dyslexia because I used to be slightly di dyslexic uh, in my mother tongue and uh, when I was struggling with the uh, Cyrillic alphabet, uh, alphabet learning Russian and I'm sometimes uh, told that I'm quite good at picking up sounds and languages and I don't really do anything special about it. So yeah, you just made me realize this, so thank you. And also, um, I forgot it. Yeah, and well. you, you guys are welcome to come up to me afterwards and share more stories because um, I'm happy to hear them. Share them with each other because I know, especially because this gathering was, was founded by the faces that you see on YouTube, it's very easy to put people on this pedestal and think that they are just so talented and everything comes so easily to them. And it's, it's often very not... It's often they're struggling with something you may not realize that makes them a lot more relatable. So whatever challenge you're dealing with, it can be surmounted. And don't feel bad when you see other people uh, getting through those things. But definitely share some of your struggles with other people. And I ha I'm happy to hear them myself as well. I just realized this. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really glad. I'm really glad I'm helping you guys realize a couple of things. And that makes me very happy. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody.